American Mental Health Counselors Association is pleased to present this special webinar on Ebola concerns and treatment and communication strategies for clinical mental health counselors. I am Joel Miller, Executive Director and CEO of the American Mental Health Counselors Association in Alexandria, Virginia. What is the Ebola virus? Ebola is a disease of humans and other primates caused by Ebola viruses. Signs and symptoms typically start between two days and three weeks after contracting the virus as a fever, sore throat, muscle pain, and headaches. Then vomiting, diarrhea, and rash usually follow, along with the decreased function of the liver and kidneys. At this time, some people begin to bleed, both internally and externally. The disease has a high risk of death, killing between 25% and 90% of those infected with the virus, with an average risk of 50%. This is often due to low, low blood pressure from fluid loss and typically follows 6 to 16 days after symptoms appear. What is Ebola and how does it spread? The virus spreads by direct contact with blood or body fluids of an infected human or other animal. Infection with the virus may also occur by direct contact with a recently contaminated item or surface. Spread of the disease through the air has not been documented in the natural environment. Ebola may be spread by semen or breast milk for several weeks to months after recovery. African fruit bats are believed to be the normal carrier in nature able to spread the virus without being affected by it. Humans become infected by contact with the bats or with a living or dead animal that has been affected by the bats. After human infection occurs, the disease may also spread between people. Other diseases such as malaria, cholera, typhoid fever, and meningitis may resemble the Ebola virus. Blood samples are tested for viral RNA, viral anti antibodies, or for the virus itself to confirm the diagnosis. So how do we help clients manage their anxiety over Ebola? Obviously, managing one's fear about Ebola is a key. With the news of a confirmed death from Ebola a couple of weeks ago in the United States, many Americans are concerned about the potential impact of the virus and its potential spread to other humans. Until now, most of the deaths have been within Africa and specifically the West African nations. The tragic death of Thomas Duncan and the subsequent illnesses of caregivers brought the risks of this dangerous virus closer to home. For people with friends and family in African countries impacted by Ebola outbreaks, concern and anxiety may be magnified given the nature of the disease. While news coverage has raised awareness of the risks of Ebola, some reports have obscured some of the most important facts. Essentially, and to quote Yogi Berra, it's kind of deja vu all over again. Uh, this isn't the first time we have experienced an unknown, scary infectious disease. Cases of avian flu, West Nile disease, swine flu, and others have certainly caused fear and some panic. People feared the worst then as well. Although some did get sick and some did die, the disease outbreaks were contained and managed. Yes, some mistakes have been made recently concerning the Ebola virus by the Centers for Disease Control, also known as CDC. Uh, caregivers and politicians have made hay, but many have not been helpful. 
in their process of potentially quarantine people who have arrived from Africa who treated patients with the Ebola virus. But now we can apply what we have learned. Research and resilience research specifically teaches us that when we make it through one adverse adversity, we can more readily cope positively with other adversities in the future. And I believe we have learned some very valuable lessons over the last few weeks. So how do we help clients manage their anxiety over Ebola or other infectious disease? The U.S. Centers for Disease Control, the CDC, continues to report that Ebola poses no substantial risk to the U.S. general population. Be Ebola is spread through direct contact with the bodily fluids of people who are sick with or have died from the disease. It can be particularly difficult to watch events that may impact your loved ones unfold from a distance, resulting in feelings of helplessness. Unfortunately, news about the spread of Ebola may give rise to feelings of stress, anxiety, and fear of the future. Such responses are understandable given the disease's uncertainties and the poor prognosis for many who contact it. Although Ebola is a threat that is being taken very seriously by public health authorities worldwide, mental health and public health professionals should emphasize that do not let your worry about this disease control your life. There are many simple and effective ways to manage an individual's fears and anxieties and stress that clinical mental health counselors can employ. Specifically, many of them are essential ingredients for a healthy lifestyle. In other words, adapting them can help improve overall emotional and physical well-being. What does science reveal about the importance of preparatory communication in large-scale incidents? You know, the possibility of a catastrophic incident such as a pandemic, severe weather, or a terrorist attack creates unease for many people. Experts who study risk perception and people's potential reactions to unpredictable threats say that Americans can prepare themselves psychologically and therefore feel more in control if such an event were to occur. Clinical mental health counselors' understanding of communication science, particularly how health and risk messaging should be done, will be particularly useful in light of the current outbreak of Ebola, not only out of concern for people in West Africa, but because there are now cases that have been treated in the United States. So the question is, what scares people the most about a threat from a contagious disease or a natural disaster? Are fear and anxiety a normal response? You know, many experts on public health and risk perception say that fear about pandem potential pandemics, catastrophic incidents, often originates from a feeling of lack of control and a perceived inability to, to prevent the problem or threat. You know, some level of anxiety is constructive in that it motivates people to take appropriate action, assuming such actions are available and recommended. But without any recommended course of action, anxiety around these threats or concerns has the potential to become debilitating for some individuals. Experts who study people's reactions to health, safety, and environmental risks say fear is a normal response to an unpredictable threat. Anxiety is also a normal response to ambiguous situations over which one has little or no control. Anxiety about the future and fears of terrorism were quite normal after the September 11th terrorist attacks in 2011, and some people continue to feel anxious about the future. What can people do to lessen their anxiety about a health risk or environmental threat? People can keep the actual degree of risk they are facing in, pro in its proper perspective and create a plan just in case. Clinical mental health counselors who specialize in managing stress and anxiety say that people who feel some sense of control while dealing with a scary unknown situation handle the unexpected 
much, much better. How can parents communicate serious health threats to children? According to clinical mental health counselors who work with children, parents should explain clearly what is known about the situation. They should present strategies for eliminating or preventing the feared situation, and this should include education and discussion that increase a sense of feeling of control and knowing that actions will lead to certain results. Child and adolescent experts also say that older children can help their younger siblings and peers feel less anxiety by reassuring them that they are not alone in the situation. Mental health professional, professionals who research responses after the 9-11 terrorist attacks found that if parents were distressed about terrorism, they conveyed that information directly and indirectly to their children, which in turn raised the distress levels of their of their offspring or children. Adolescence distress following 9-11 was also associated with perceived parental availability to discuss the attacks. A key to understanding parents' influences on adolescence adjustment may lie in parents' ability to manage their own distress, of course, and voice their concerns appropriately. Mental health professionals can play a role in helping parents manage their own distress and providing guidance on how best to respond to their children. So when does a person's fear over this kind of threat become a problem that may need treatment? If a person is having trouble with daily functioning and regular routines, then a visit to a clinical mental health counselor is advisable. A clinical mental health counselor can assess the duration of the problem and the array and severity of symptoms. Anxiety about an ambiguous future is a natural and normal emotion, and experts say that it is important not to pathologize normal responses to potentially traumatic experiences. But when such anxiety does interfere with a person's normal day-to-day -day functioning, that person should seek help from a clinical mental health counselor. There will not be one universal reaction to a catastrophic event, but it is important to recognize that an individual's degree of emotional response will not necessarily be proportional to the degree of exposure, amount of loss, or proximity to an illness. As we noted, clinical mental health counselors can help individuals manage their own distress and provide guidance on how to best respond to their children. But of course, it is different strokes for different folks. Experts on risk and decision making can identify what is critical to convey to many or different audiences. Young people have different information needs than do older people. Those with children or those taking care of elderly parents, those with health problems, and those who are away from home at the time of an emergency all have different information needs. You know, behavioral scientists, other experts can, uh, can identify these different groups' belief systems and aid in designing comprehensible messages and evaluate their success. Re research shows that people listen to messages more often when they come from professional experts rather than when they come from politicians. This is particularly true when the messages are emergency messages and audience are racial and ethnic mi minority groups. Also, the public, in quotes, is not a monolithic ent entity. Some individuals are more vulnerable than others. For example, individuals with prior mental health conditions or difficulties, individuals who also may have a disability. Therefore, it is important to target services to those who need them the most. And speaking of different strokes for different folks, researchers who have studied communications find that certain ways of presenting information increase the perception of risk and thus fear. Specifically, people are more fearful when they see individuals or case studies similar to themselves rather than statistics. And the greater the lack of perceived control associated with that fear message, the greater the fear and discomfort. So it is important to communicate a reason for concern, but it is also important to explain very clearly how to prevent what is feared by including tactics or strategies for controlling the feared situation. Also, 
important is reminding people of the degree of risk presented by the situation. That is the odds of the event's occurrence based on their life circumstances. Those who specialize in how to design uh, warnings affect how warnings affect human behavior have learned that people want easy to comprehend information and access to more information if they want it. The news media will play a critical role if a health emergency occurs. Information flow to the public about very bad news should not be controlled in the name of trying to avoid an outbreak of mass panic. Of course, the public should be armed with information, but credible, timely information. Clinical mental health counselors can reduce anxiety and the noise level that we are witnessing relative to Ebola. First, keep things in perspective. Clinical mental health counselors can help limit the worry and agitation of their clients by encouraging that they lessen the time individuals and families spend watching or listening to upsetting media coverage. Although clients want to keep informed, especially if they have loved ones in affected countries, it will be important for counselors to remind them to take a break from watching the news and focus on the things that are positive in one's life and things that clients have control over. Another approach is get the facts to your clients. Help clients get the right information that will help them accurately determine risks so they can take reasonable precautions if necessary and if appropriate. Another area where clinical mental health counselors can reduce anxiety and the overall noise level we're witnessing is to keep pressing upon your clients to stay healthy. Clinical mental health counselors need to convey that the risk of Ebola transmission is extremely low. A healthy lifestyle, including proper diet and exercise, enough sleep, is one's best defense against any threat. Adapting hygienic habits such as washing your hands regularly will also minimize an individual's exposure to all types of germs and disease sources. Clinical mental health counselors can convey as part of the engagement with clients to eat healthy, avoid alcohol and drugs, and take a walk or exercise on a daily basis. A healthy body can have a positive impact on one's thoughts and emotions. Another approach is keep, keep your clients connected. Your clients need to maintain social networks and activities which can help maintain a sense of normalcy and provide key outlets for sharing feelings and relieving stress. This may also be an ideal time for clients to become more involved with their community by receiving and sharing effective information obtained by reliable sources. It's keeping it simple. Keep Keeping involved in usual activities in order to stay engaged in daily life routines helps to maintain perspective and to move forward effectively. And also seek additional help. Individuals who feel an overwhelming nervousness, a lingering sadness, or other prolonged reaction that adversely affects their life, work, or relationships due to all of the discussions surrounding Ebola should be carefully watched in order to help people deal with any extreme stress or stressful situation. Maybe most importantly, clinical me mental health counselors should uphold hope. Counselors should convey that just as importantly, we must maintain hope and optimism that we will be all okay, that our family and friends will be safe, and that Ebola will, will remain controlled. Staying stuck in the negatives, the fears, or the what-ifs interferes with daily life routines and can reduce ability to cope with other stresses. Help your clients and others around your clients to stay energized and motivated to carry on with normal life activities. It is a real key to reducing anxiety and reducing the volume surrounding the Ebola virus. Thank you very much for your attendance and for more information about the Ebola virus and the work of the American Mental Health Counselors Association, please go to www.
amhca.org or call us at 703-548-6002. We are hopeful that this special webinar presentation will provide timely, relevant information for your practice and for your incredibly important work on behalf of your clients. Thank you again 